A show of support. Egypt's Prime Minister visits the Gaza Strip as the conflict with Israel threatens to escalate. We ask how long will the peace treaty between Israel and Egypt last? And what kind of pressure can be exerted to prevent hostilities spreading across the Middle East and perhaps beyond? Hello and welcome to Inside Story. I'm David Foster. On Friday, Egypt's Prime Minister Hisham Kandil visited the Gaza Strip, his mission to show support, he said, for the Palestinians and try to broker a truce. But hopes for even a brief ceasefire while he was inside Gaza were immediately dashed. The violence on both sides continued. And Israel has called up thousands of army reservists for a possible ground offensive, it's thought. More from Nadim Baba. Israel promised to show no mercy and for a third day the bombs fell. This is the interior ministry in Gaza, one of the overnight targets. The extent of the damage here, an indication of the force of Israel's bombardment. From early morning, Israeli tanks and heavy artillery gathered at the border with Gaza. 16,000 Israeli reservists have now been called up for a possible ground assault. Israel says the hail of Hamas rockets, like this one on a house in southern Israel, is justification for its repeated airstrikes. There was a promise of a temporary reprieve in the violence on Friday, but in the end, a promise is all it turned out to be. In an unprecedented show of solidarity with the Palestinian people, Egypt's Prime Minister Hisham Khandil arrived in the Gaza Strip. At Egypt's request, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said he'd temporarily suspend the attacks for the duration of Khandil's visit. That was provided fighters in Gaza did the same. This tragedy requires an urgent intervention, serious and honest action from all sides. This is what Egypt has started to do and will continue to do until this aggression is ended, until Palestinian national unity is achieved to the interest of the Palestinian people, until lasting peace is established and the Palestinian state is set up with Jerusalem as its capital. But as Khandil spoke at a hospital treating the injured, a series of loud explosions in Gaza. And there was word of more rockets falling in Israel. Many in the densely populated Gaza Strip are now pinning their hopes on Egypt's Prime Minister to broker an end to the violence. Nadim Barber, Al Jazeera, Gaza. So could the fighting between Israel and Hamas get worse? To try and answer this question, we're joined by our three guests. In Cairo, Gamal Abdel Gawad, a professor of political science at the American University in the Egyptian capital. He's also a consultant to the Al Ahram Center for Political and Strategic Studies. In Oxford, Eugene Rogan, University Lecturer of Modern History of the Middle East and a faculty member of Oriental Studies with the University of Oxford. And also in Cairo, Nada Omran, a member of the political committee of the Freedom and Justice Party. Welcome to all three of you. Uh, Dr. Rogan, first to you, do, you. do you believe this is the first major test of, of how New Egypt sees itself and its status? But it's certainly the first real test of New Egypt's relationship with Israel. I mean, right since the 25th of January 2011, Israel has really not been a primary concern for the new government of Egypt. But as long as Israel didn't make such an incursion that would really shock or outrage public opinion, uh, Israel could stay off the charts. Now we see Israeli action in the Gaza Strip setting off very strong public relations, uh, public opinion reactions in Egypt. And this is the first Egyptian president popularly elected. He cannot overlook his own sort of public reaction. So when his prime minister goes to Gaza Strip, is it showboating? In other words, just, just a demonstration of you know, friendship with the, the Palestinian people, or is it a sign of, of something more serious, about a shifting in the dynamics of the Egypt-Israel relationship? Well, it's a sign that the new government of Egypt is going to have to be very active in redefining relations with Israel. And so by making a show of support at this moment to the beleaguered Hamas authorities, they're really showing the Israelis that they will not stand by as Mubarak did and watch Gaza pummeled.
OK, let me bring in Nader Omran on this. It, it wasn't so many months ago that an official from the Muslim Brotherhood said, and I'll quote, we weren't party to the peace treaty. It was signed away from the Egyptian people, and thus the people must have their say. Uh, that implied in the minds of some that there would be a, a referendum, perhaps revisions to the treaty. Do you think that's a possibility? Yeah, at the very beginning we said that uh, we are respecting all the treaties for the time being and for the next stage because Egypt is more concerned about its internal policies for this uh, period which is very sensitive and transnational and so to build a democracy you have to put all the treaties or all the major decisions of the country to a vote by the people not on the peace treaty with Israel but any other major treaty with any country so that's a kind of applying the will of the people to choose what they want and what they don't want. But for the time being, we didn't discuss and we don't feel that there is a need now to uh, redefine or re-discuss the issues with Israel as a peace treaty. So you don't think at the moment that, that it should be changed? Uh, it should be reconsidered after a specific time, which the people themselves will will decide. Because, you know, as, we, as, as I said, nobody took the opinion of Egyptians when this treaty was uh, signed some 33 years ago. Now we are trying to apply a new rule of uh, democracy which gives the people by parliament and by referendum the right to see what's their uh, opinion and what they see about the treaties with other countries in general. Professor Gawad, uh, does Israel need the peace treaty more than Egypt needs the peace treaty or, or, or do both countries uh, find it absolutely vital to, to, to not just their own stability but to, to regional uh, security? Well, I, I, I believe both countries equally need the peace treaty for, uh, uh, for Egypt, not now, not in the near future. Uh, uh, the country can take the risk of another military confrontation with Israel, something that could be imminent if the peace, is re peace treaty to be uh, undermined or cancelled. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, Israel, even though it is uh, uh, the, military, the military balance between the two countries is uh, uh, advantages for Israel, but uh, uh, Israel also doesn't uh, need another military confrontation with the largest Arab, uh, Arab country, with Egypt. Uh, not only because of the military dimension to it, but because of the radicalization of Egyptian foreign policy will definitely resonate in the rest of the region and uh, definitely will change the entire uh, regional and security dynamics but, but surrounding Israel. Let me, let, let me Israel. put this to you, if, if I may. I mean, we're talking about um, a treaty which presumably means a great deal um, to the Egyptian people, but in, in terms of the, the aid that the uh, Egyptians get from America, which is predicated on the basis that, that the peace treaty remains in place, we're talking about roughly $2 billion a year, which the, the new government in Egypt could ill afford to lose. Yeah, this is, this is another risk for Egypt. Uh, the peace treaty for Egypt is not just a, a, a kind of, a, I, I would consider it a cornerstone in Egypt's security arrangements, but also in Egypt's uh, foreign policy relations, actually, particularly in Egypt's relation with the United States, and by, uh, by and large to other Western countries, definitely, if the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty is endangered, uh, I don't think I don't think is, uh, Egypt can maintain receiving the American military and economic aid that it is it has been receiving for decades, uh, and definitely the uh, Egyptian government will not be able to attract the foreign yeah. uh, investment that is badly needed in the country to alleviate the economic And it needs to be seen here. to be stable to continue to attract that foreign investment. So, so Dr. Regan, let, let me put this one to you. If Egypt does not change its stance, uh, then Israel effectively has impunity as ever to do pretty much what it wants. Nothing changes. No, I think things have changed dramatically. And I think that the visit by Prime Minister Kandil goes to show that there really is a new order in Egypt. Egypt is in control of the border between Sinai and the Gaza Strip, and it's allowing world leaders for the first time to legitimate the Hamas government in Gaza. We saw Sheikh Hamad visit uh, last month. There are plans for an Erdogan visit short, uh, shortly. And, and I think having the Prime Minister of Egypt visit to the Gaza Strip is a very significant development. It but, but, never but happened But that, that's on Mubarak. a diplomatic basis, isn't it? In, in simple, stark mm -hmm. terms, militarily, um, Israel completely 
outnumbers and out, would outmaneuver um, in every way the Egyptian military, which is the biggest Arab military that there is. I don't think that there's any point in talking about a possible military response from Egypt. If Egypt were to break the peace treaty with Israel, it would not be to go to war with Israel. It would be to make the symbolic gesture saying, we distance ourselves from a country whose policies are so inimical to our values. And, and that's what we're talking about here. But there isn't really a country in the region that would want to, let alone contemplate, taking on Israel. So what is the worst that could happen um, in terms of the current situation, uh, unless some kind of ceasefire is broken, in your opinion? Well, you are dealing with the region at a moment of very heightened volatility, and I think for Israel, every one of its frontiers is on high alert. You obviously have seen Syria in meltdown, and now you have shells going into the Golan Heights. This has overflowed into Lebanon already. Jordan has had three days of rioting because of price hikes, and the king's position is looking very, very dodgy. And now you have a new regime in Egypt with which Israel is, for its own reasons, strategically bound to try and keep relations going with. So. To allow peace treaties now to break down and to try and redefine a regional order on the back of such instability is clearly not in Israel's interest either. Uh, Nader Emre, lis listening to what um, Dr. Reagan was saying there about the instability in, in Jordan uh, draws me to something I read a short while ago, which was a poll carried out by Pechter group which said that 52 percent of those questioned in this poll in Jordan didn't want to see the peace treaty continue uh, between their country that's the 1994 peace treaty between their country Jordan and Israel so, so how do those countries that object to what Israel is doing here apply pressure on Israel and the outside world which supported or those aspects of the outside world which supported to, to change its stance what can be done uh, I, first of all, I don't think that the peace treaty with Israel, uh, either by Jordan or with Egypt, is the only way or the only way to uh, pressurize uh, the situation between Israel and, uh, and Gaza or Israel and Egypt. We have another tools of uh, pressure which we can use, and everybody knows that uh, Gaza is so close to us, and we can Gaza now is under sanctions. Gaza now is occupied by Israel, so. This is the main issue. Let's rephrase what we can say now about what uh, Gazans are doing. Okay, they a, are a whole resisting. host of other ways, you, you said. What other ways? Let's say, for example, opening the Rafah border 24 hours for people and for goods, for help for Gaza to try to alleviate the burdens on the, on the Palestinians. And also uh, this way of, of, of uh, withdrawing our... Uh, ambassador from Israel is a very big uh, message to Israel that we are not like before. We are not like Mubarak regime, who was a very big supporter, as uh, some Israelis said on TV, to the and they were thanking uh, Mubarak. So this era is already over. Now we are a new era. We are standing by our brothers in Palestine, and we consider them that they are resist. They have the right for resistance. It's not just an equal war or equal confrontation. It's like this. So rephrasing all these things and redefining what's the resistance, what is occupation, I think this is a big uh, story to, to, to pressurize Israel and to put pressure on Israel and also to for the whole people of the world that knew that there is a new Egypt. It's not like before. Uh, Professor Gawad, uh, did Egypt attempt to, to redefine its relationship uh, with Israel? Was there a sign when, when the gas treaty between the two countries um, was ended uh, several months ago. Egypt effectively saying, look, I'm sorry, we just don't need to do this anymore. You're not paying your bills. Why should we? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. The, uh, the, uh, a, a regime dominated by the Muslim brother in Egypt is, uh, is very unlikely to continue the same policies towards Israel. Uh, the, the distance between the two countries is, uh, is getting bigger. The, uh, uh, the, what used to be a cold peace is getting even colder. Uh, right now, but uh, I'm uh, so far the government and the president in Egypt are keen to maintain the, the uh, to, to downgrade the peace treaty to its minimum, uh, uh, a no war, uh, a no war state actually, or a state of no war. Uh, other than that, that the the the, 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 the new regime in Egypt is not interested in, in any kind of relation. Uh, relations with Israel. Uh, the problem is with the uh, uh, similar developments like those happening now 
uh, in Gaza, things get, get volatile and it gets very difficult uh, to uh, 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 keep the relationship or uh, maintain it the way the, the, the new leadership in Egypt uh, d desire. The problem with the new leadership in Egypt now is that it's torn apart between two kinds of commitments, I would say. One commitment toward the, toward the Israel and the United States uh, regarding the peace uh, treaty with Israel, even though this could be downgraded to the minimum. On the other hand, another commitment towards a broad audience in Egypt and region-wise, uh, 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 where the, uh, the Muslim brothers have been preaching a kind of a hardline policy vis-a-vis -vis Israel and the Palestinians, rejecting all kinds of peace negotiations, uh, not recognizing the state of Israel, etc., uh, which would create in the current situation a kind of a credibility problem, actually, to the new leadership in Egypt. So trying to walk this very tight rope, actually, this is a challenge that the Egyptian government uh, and now it, is uh, uh, is facing is is your suggestion that that now in part the Muslim Brotherhood Freedom and Justice Party are, are facing up to what is known as real politic? You know, now that you've you've got the job, you've got to face up to, to the reality of having the power. Yeah, definitely, it's a moment of truth uh, in in uh, uh, in that regard. And uh, and l l let me say one 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 comment. I think it's important here. It is. Uh, 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 no matter what we say about the kind of rational calculations that all actors are uh, 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 exercising in this situation, definitely it is not at the interest of Egypt or Israel uh, to further escalate, to uh, uh, allow the relations between the two countries, the peace treaty, to uh, be undermined, etc. But in such volatile uh, 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 situations with the uh, tremendous pressure coming from the people uh, from below uh, at the street level, uh, 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 a lot of mistakes could happen and people and the leaders could uh, slip into situations uh, that they didn't really choose and this is many conflicts develop this way and this is why uh, the the involvement of uh, of third actors is really mm. needed not to allow this uh, this this crisis to continue secondly also this is important to explain the current egyptian diplomatic approach we know that egypt is showing support to the uh, to the gazans to the hamas etc but in the meantime the the, the number one uh, issue uh, on the Egypt's agenda now is to bring the, 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 the ceasefire between the Palestinians and the Israelis as soon as possible so that we can uh, at least postpone uh, 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 or avoid such a kind of, again, being torn apart between let, the let two, me try and two situations or two with you, uh, Dr. Rogan, in terms of the, the regional situation, going back a couple of weeks, Israel, it doesn't admit it, but Israel is widely believed to have attacked that arms factory. Um, in Sudan, the one that was allegedly owned and operated by the Iranians, uh, the thought being that it was doing that so that uh, the supply route up through Egypt, perhaps into the Gaza Strip, uh, meant that the weapons wouldn't get to Hamas in case of an assault from them. Um, is it possible that Israel could be weakening Hamas this way uh, in anticipation of an assault on Iran and that it might then turn its attention to Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, thereby having weakened both the northern and the southern fronts? There are so many conspiracy theories circulating about what motives might be driving this. And Iran is usually brought into all of these theories as a sort of fundamental point. If I, sitting back reading my newspaper, analyze the situation, Iran has been taken off the agenda for at least the next six to nine months. The rest of the world is going to wait and see what Iranian presidential elections return and what the new leadership in Iran holds for the nuclear program. So without really having a hostile Iran to deal with, it's as though the government of Benjamin Netanyahu has now turned its focus to the near threat of Hamas and has, in killing the military commander Ahmed Jabari, uh, done something really quite ill-timed. The New York Times today, not a newspaper known for being particularly sympathetic to Hamas or certainly not hostile to Israel, had argued that Hamas had been active in trying to rein in all the other militant factions in Gaza from making missile strikes on, on Israel. So the timing for killing Jabari right now seems to me to come right back far more towards perhaps crude political calculations of Netanyahu and his government going to the polls in January than anything to do with trying to rearrange the regional order.
Nada Omran, in terms of if, if Iran has been taken off the agenda as far as Israel is concerned, uh, does it worry you, therefore, that it's, a turning, it's, it's turning its attention to possible other targets and maybe other ones as well? Okay, so let's, let's redefine what's happening now uh, from our point of view. What's happening now is Israeli aggression on Palestinians in Gaza. It's not just Hamas uh, government, which is democratically uh, elected. And what we are doing now, the Egyptian government is in the government of Egypt, which is trying to help its brothers in Palestine, in Gaza. So uh, no need to say always that there is a Muslim Brotherhood is trying to help Hamas government in Gaza. So what is Israel is trying to show that it's a kind of confrontation between Israel and some Islamist group, this is wrong. Let's redefine this. When Fatah, for example, was in power before 2006, nobody can say that Israel is, 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 is dealing with Fatah, but it's dealing with Palestinians. So the same thing should apply on uh, Gaza now and for Hamas. Hamas now is uh, representing Palestinians and Dr. Morsi now is representing Egyptians. So if we put these things in the right order, so we can see that what Israel is doing now is just looking for its own interest, either in, in Iran or in Gaza or in Egypt. They are not looking for but, specific but, ideologies. But you, you um, from the Egyptian perspective, not, not you personally, but um, <coughs> the authorities in Egypt could do perhaps something to prevent the weapons getting um, to Hamas and, and other factions inside the Gaza Strip and thereby lessen the exactly. possibility of exactly. an escalation that's of the conflict. Exactly. That's, that's, I'm so surprised of, of evaluating these homemade rockets. I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm focusing or stressing on this meaning, homemade rockets against Israel, one of the biggest nuclear powers in the world. So is it, I mean, can you compare this? Uh, Gaza is under occupation, Gaza is under sanctions, and Israel having more than 300, 400 uh, nuclear warheads, and they have a, a very, uh, I mean, huge military machine which it can use 24-hour, uh, uh, 24-7, and they say that the reason behind this is just some smuggling, if there is any, uh, through tunnels. So trying to uh, move the focus on this, I think it's not fair. The fair thing is Israel, is this under occupation, is the full responsibility of Israel of all what's going in this uh, area in Gaza and also the confrontation with, uh, with either Iran or whatever. I, I just want to throw that one across to Professor Gawad. I mean, what, what are the chances, what, what could go wrong to, to see Egypt further drawn into this conflict other than in a possible peacemaking role? Well, if, if, uh, if the two sides get stubborn, I mean, the Israelis and the Palestinians, and also third parties not intervene at the right time to uh, bring back the, uh, the kind of truce between the Palestinians and the Israelis, uh, well, uh, the situation will escalate, and the Egyptian leadership will find it very difficult to uh, maintain a distance or avoiding uh, getting more implicated in this conflict. I, um, it's very, uh, it's very kind of remote possibilities. I would say it is still there, but it is, uh, 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 it is, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's. Uh, I think it's remote possibility, and I, I, yeah. I believe that uh, uh, Egypt and the others will be able to uh, uh, convince Hamas and convince Israel also of uh, putting an end after some escalation. The, it will get yeah. worse before it gets okay, better, uh, but I don't think this will be the, the, the kind of the detrimental crisis. And Dr. Region, Dr. Rogan, uh, a, a final thought. I'm afraid we're getting near the end of the program. Is this going to be, however, unpleasant and however much it, it may escalate over the next day or so? Is it going to be a local conflict, effectively, or could it escalate into something uh, bigger and more dangerous? With Israeli reservists massing on Gaza's frontiers, you cannot rule out the possibility of an Israeli invasion of Gaza. And then Gaza really would go from being under a state of siege to a new state of occupation. If we were to see the kind of disproportionate killing as we saw in Operation Cast Lead, in which 1,400 Palestinians lost their lives in three weeks of hostilities, then I think it would be an absolute game changer. And we could even see the undoing of you know, peace treaties and, uh, and, and you know, Israel really on the brink of uh, creating a new regional order that would be very deeply destabilizing. So this is, this is a very volatile moment. Well, thank you very much indeed to, to all of our guests from Cairo, Gamal Abdel Gawad and Nada Omran, also in the Egyptian capital, and in Oxford, you. Eugene Rogan, and thank you.
Uh, your thoughts too. Welcome. Send them to Inside Story at Al Jazeera.net. Inside Story at Al Jazeera.net. From me, David Foster, and the rest of the Inside Story team, thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye bye.